नमस्कार इन दिस एपिसोड ऑफ दिल से वी हैव थ्री एक्स्ट्रॉर्डनरी गेस्ट्स एंड वी गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट समथिंग दैट्स नॉट टॉक्ड अबाउट बिकॉज मोस्ट ऑफ द कॉन्वर्सेशन वी हैव इन दिस कंट्री आर अबाउट द रिच एंड द पावरफुल अबाउट गवर्नमेंट वॉट गवर्नमेंट डज वॉट गवर्नमेंट डज नॉट डू एज यू ऑल नो दैट गवर्नमेंट इज द रिपोजिट्री ऑफ अ लॉट ऑफ मनी एंड दे यूज इट फॉर द पब्लिक गुड सो दे से बट with a population of 1.4 billion people in this country the most populous democracy in the world that money is not enough to reach the marginalized the poorest of the poor who takes care of them well the government tries to take care of them but there are what are called non government organizations who have over the years done a lot of work for the marginalized the poor the adivasis the dalits the scheduled caste the scheduled tribes people have who have no access to money who have no access to justice and who live day to day just to survive and therefore foreign contributions were allowed over the years for money to come in apart from the fact that the government itself allocates money for some of these adivasis and tribal welfare and stuff like that but the ngos through the ngos this money through foreign contributions were allowed to percolate down so that they can uplift the conditions in which they survive we have three extraordinary individuals who are going to discuss about issues of the marginalized and the weakest and what the ngos did and we're going to just discuss uh the judgment of the supreme court which actually upheld the restrictions placed in the 2020 amendment foreign contribution regulation act we have on the left side colin gonzalez who is a lawyer is a colleague of mine in supreme court he has done a lot of public interest work and we'll talk about that in, in a while we have harsh mandar he is the author of several books he works on the ground he was a member of the ias in 1980 gave up the job in 2002 very few people in the country do that he served in madhya pradesh he served in chatisgarh and i think realizing the state of the poor in that state i guess that must have emotionally impacted him and that's why he gave it all up well, i have rahul narayan who is a lawyer is a is a partner uh, at a very important law firm who's celebrating 10 years today of yes, its sir, existence uh, he also does a lot of uh, work on this on these issues uh, he is uh, in fact a bcl from oxford he is uh, he is admitted to practice both in the uk as well as in india and he's worked in a law firm in the uk as well so i'm delighted to have you the first thing i want to ask you is you have seen the way these ngos have functioned and you've seen the kind of restrictions that have been placed by the act amendment of 2020 what are your views on it well a couple i've seen uh, these ngos for the last 30 years and i've been doing legal aid work for them for 30 years all my pils that we did with uh, tremendous results in the earlier days particularly was based on the information they gave me what kind of people were these brilliant people dedicated people people with integrity and passion who believed in making a new india what were their salaries with an ma degree phd degree maybe 50000 at the maximum but you charge 200 rupees for a case that you did per day i believe is that true 5 rupees at a peer 50 rup- uh, what was it 200 rupees an appearance Well, how can we do that you're an iit graduate from bombay iit That's right. you gave it up yeah. and you decided to work for the poor well i decided to do what my heart told me to do and i got tremendous joy out of it which i didn't get in engineering at all and i found the legal system then very open to change in helping the poor and all that that's not the situation today but the people were wonderful people and when the fcra cancellations began across the country from the next day couple from the next day i saw people who had families to feed and so on their paychecks stopped no notice bank accounts frozen everything stopped registrations cancelled i saw people who were in their 60s 
but but they say, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah, no you. Problem. They say that many of these Christian charitable organizations from, from abroad who used to send money here. The intent was to convert people to Christianity. That's what they said. Is there said any also. data on record? No, no. Th that's what they said in the Kandamal rights. So I paid particular attention because I took that PIL to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. and there was not a shred of evidence on record. Mm -hmm. And even today, I don't think that's a shred of evidence on record. Is there any data on the website of the government to tell us as to how many people have been, uh, you know, persuaded to change their religion no. by, by offering them some gifts or offering them some... No, not at all. In fact, mm -hmm. the reverse is true. That in many places, in the Kandamal case, I saw that, that Christians who were Christians for years were told you get out of the village or you go back. Garvapasi was the conversion in the reverse. That was allowed freely and openly. And if you said, no, I won't do it, you had to leave the village in the country. I believe you were the, you were the one who filed a litigation on behalf of the uh, you know, P PUCL, which became the basis of the Food Security Act. Is that true? That's right. That's right. That was many years ago, but that was such a wonderful case, couple, because it was basically for people who had no food to eat, Malnutrition was at 50%, 60%. So you, you, your, your efforts brought about an act called the brought Food Security an Act. act yeah. And today that food security work, yeah. the right to food work, Harsh will tell you more about that. And that campaign on the right to food, FCRA cancelled work, stopped. So all the work taking place to educate people on their rights, PILs to get them food, maternity benefit for pregnant women, all stopped, all crashed. Harsh, you've been in Madhya Pradesh, you've been in Chhattisgarh, you know, your heart obviously was, was, was moved by what you saw. What did you see and what's, what's been your journey like? India is a, it is a, India is a democracy, um, but, but it's inequalities. Uh, I think we've lived with inequalities for much too long. Um, you know, I think when uh, the history of our times is written. This is going to be seen as one of the most cruel periods in human history. Because, you know, the levels of hunger and malnutrition that Colin just spoke about, in any time would be sort of unconscionable. But at a time when we have, uh, we had about 60 million tons of grain in, in government warehouses. Uh, you know, Yodhra has explained that if you put the bags of grain in, in a line, you can go from the earth to the moon and come back and circle the earth a couple of times. When you have that much grain and you have every second child Bangladesh, today it's every third child, uh, there's something drastically wrong. And, uh, you know, that we continue to... Uh, Amartya Sen somewhere said that India and China are both equally unequal, but the penalty of inequality is much greater in India. Because if you're on the bottom 10% in China, uh, you can still expect that your child, when she falls sick, will get into a government hospital, which is reasonable, will have a decent school, etc. In India, at the bottom 10% and way beyond that, we, we, can't, we can't assume it. 80% um, of India's doctors work for the private sector. It's 80%. So I think that we, we, you know, that's one part of the problem. And then, uh, in, especially in, in recent years, in recent decades, in the past decade in particular, we're seeing also uh, a campaign of hate uh, that is target in the, targeting India's... Uh, we'll come to that. We come to that a little minorities, later. Well, as well. I, 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 I'll come to that a little. I want to ask you, I mean, I want to tell the viewers some a very interesting data that is... Of the total national income that we have, 1% of the total population of this country, which is 104 lakhs of people, own, uh, are, have 22% of the national income. One, that is 104 lakh people have 20% of the national income. The bottom 50% of this country, that is 7 crore people, have 50% of the national income. That's the kind of inequality that you're talking about. And coming back to the NGOs, the NGOs were set up where? Set up in rural areas. As I see, 50% of all work was in the rural areas and in aspirational districts. They worked on education, 
on health, on nutrition, on livelihoods, on water and on sanitation, climate change, agriculture, women and child rights. This was the focus of all NGOs, pursuant to money come from, coming from outside. And the Supreme Court said that this money can, has the potential of impacting the sovereignty, the integrity of India and impacted public interest and therefore uh, we have a right to close them down. I think um, two or three things. The strength of a democracy uh, is directly proportional to the strength of the power of opposition uh, to the executive and the power of, of institutions to dissent. And we have all the way down from parliament to the judiciary to, uh, to academia to the media. But at a time when all of these are crumbling, it is ultimately people's organizations that, that still have the independence and perhaps the conscience to dissent. And I, I see that a lot of the attacks that are happening now are happening uh, in order to suppress dissent. I mean, you don't, you know, I think, uh, I think it was Nivedita Menon, she said, I love my country not because it is perfect, I love my country so much, that is why I need to criticize it when it goes wrong, because I want it to improve. So criticism of the state uh, is, is an act of, 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 of courageous, uh, especially in the times that we live in, are acts of courage and love uh, for, uh, for the values of the constitution itself. And to call that uh, potentially damaging to our sovereignty, political parties can get foreign money, uh, you know, private companies can get foreign money. None of that damages our sovereignty. No, no. Now under the under the electoral bond scheme, as yeah. you know, the Companies yeah. Act was amended, yes. and a foreign company with a hundred percent subsidiary actually can contribute to political yeah. parties. So, so, so they can contribute to political parties, yeah. and the conglomerates in India mm -hmm. can contribute to uh, to political parties. Yeah. They can actually run these schemes. They are not a danger. Yeah, to yeah. the sovereignty and integrity of India, but money come from outside becomes a danger to the sovereignty and integrity of India. I've never been able to understand that the distinction, logic, Rahul, logic. have you? No, sir. To be honest, you are completely right. It seems unusual that political parties can get funded from abroad, companies can get funded from abroad, individuals can pitch for work abroad and get work from abroad, but NGOs in particular are such a grave danger that they need to be regulated in a, such a strict manner. I think. It's important to remember that uh, a democracy thrives on self-help groups. The fact it is a, a big strength of our, of our country and of our democracy that there are so many small groups who band together to improve their lives and improve the lives of others around them. The fact that they need funding is, is, is fairly universal. And to my mind, the way to look at it is simply this. What are the ways in which they can get funds? The source of the funds is important as so it shouldn't be it shouldn't be tainted money in, in one way or the other. But whether the money is from India or abroad, it shouldn't really be that much of a problem. I think that the narrative that taking money from abroad for charitable purposes is somehow bad, whereas taking money for for doing for, for companies is somehow good is something that I've never I'd been able to you, understand. I'll ask you a follow-up question. Will the corporate sector fund these organizations in India? No. Because if they fund these organizations, then these organizations criticize what the government is doing. The corporate sector will be harmed by the government itself. So no member of the corporate sector will be willing to fund the NGOs here. So who will fund the NGOs? There's not enough money going around. The total budget for 24-25 is 47 lakh crores, right? Very little of that goes to the tribal communities or the Adivasis or the marginalized communities. In fact, funding has been going down over the years. Either it has remained static or it's going down. So basically, where is this funding going to come from? It has to come from abroad. There is no other way in which this can be funded. And let me tell you a statistic which you'll be surprised with. In the 2012 report of the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, civil society organizations, these NGOs, accounted for 27 lakh jobs and 34 lakh full-time volunteers, generating employment figures higher than the public sector. But it's not surprising. And this I is a 12, 2012 figure. Yeah. I don't have the latest figure because I don't think that's been collated. It's not in the public domain because I wanted to give you official data. So not only 
are these organizations helping the marginalized and the poor. They're also creating jobs in the country. Now, I don't see the reason as to why this funding should be stopped if they're doing such good work. And if there's an organization that is violating the law, the government must go after it. There is nothing on the website of the government saying that this organization has violated this law and therefore we have frozen its assets. There is no website of the government. No. Right? There's a general story that the NGOs are doing something hanky-panky with foreign money. General story. But you will never find Organization A misused money to this extent for this purpose. Organization B is anti-national because it did this. You'll never find allegations against 99% of the NGOs. I think the allegations when they do come and when they are examined many times, they could just be, the FCRA is, uh, has always been a complicated law to, uh, to follow in the sense that there are ambiguities in, in the law. Yes. So the, po the point of the, in, the entire exercise like this when you have such a strong and draconian law is that it should be exercised in a very fair way and you should give people notice of what, what it is that you mean. If you change the interpretation of a particular clause and say retrospectively, hi, you've done this, therefore I'm going to come after you. It's also not a fair way or a proportionate way to go about it. Now, let me just talk about the restrictions that came about through the amendment of 2020. One of the restrictions was that you could only open a bank account in, a, in the State Bank of India, which is the authorized bank to open one the bank. In one, one branch of the State Bank of India. All NGOs which are funding uh, which are being funded from abroad had to open that account. Okay, and you had to have a utilization account in another nationalized bank and every penny of your expenditure had to be explained. Right? Now that's a Herculean regulatory framework which is very difficult to follow and difficult to implement. Uh, and you must have had experience that's, a, that's absolutely right. And we all thought that it was a, a very unusual requirement for a country of a billion, pe more than a billion people, a, such a, the seventh largest country in the world, and only one bank account, one uh, where you could open... The open largest country account. in terms of population in the world. The largest right. country in terms of population in the world. And uh, foreign contributions to NGOs would be allowed only if, if they opened that account in that one particular place. And what's even more important is that NGOs can come in all sizes. Organizations that obtain money could be very large, they could be very small. If you are a five-man organization, a five-woman organization in Odisha, are you going to, who's doing stuff for, for, uh, for, rural, for rural women? Would you then de depute somebody to come to Delhi, camp outside the SBI, which, which will have to deal with 16,000, 20,000 applications, open that account, how would, you, how would you be able to justify it? And in particular, remember, there's also a restriction that only 20% can be but used for... That will come to later. We come to, I'm just the the, the follow-up question is that when you open an account, now you have to spend that money. Now you have to spend that money in the area, maybe a rural area in Odisha, maybe a rural area in uh, Madhya Pradesh or whatever. Now you have to have a bank there and you have to withdraw money. Now, a, an organization which is funding from outside must have then offices all over the country to be able to service the fund, right? That's impossible. No organization would like to come here to do that. And therefore, and just to give you a figure so that the people of this country should know that since 2019, 20,699 NGOs registration has been canceled. 20,000. Yeah. So we are left with 16,875 registered NGOs in this country now. So that much of funding will not come and government funds are not enough for the marginalized. So where will they go? And the average income of a marginalized household, the leading member in the marginalized household doesn't earn more than 5,000 rupees a month. That's the state of affairs. The second restriction which you just talked about was they said that only 20% of the funding that you get, an NGO gets, must be spent on administrative expenses. Previously, the limit was 50%. They've reduced it to 20%. Now, how does, how, how does an organization manage that? That's the question that you were even... Exactly. The simple point is they find it very difficult to do. Organizations like this also need good people if they need good people, they need to pay those good people, for example. If, for example, they wish to participate in a mela in the, uh, of the government of India, they need to buy those, that, that space. 
they need to spend on all kind of things. So it is a 20% requirement is very, very difficult for them to implement. What, what eventually happens is, because the administrative expenses are not defined, a lot of time is spent debating whether the following expenditure would be administrative or not administrative. So you get out of the work of doing what you're supposed to do and spend all of your time in, in compliance. Right. A kind of, uh, an unusual kind of new license Raj. So sometimes the restrictions are such that the object of bringing in the money and serving people at the bottom of the ladder is lost. Yes, it is. And you must have seen that, Harsh. Yeah, repeatedly. But, you know, I just wanted to sort of edge in one, one response. What is the purpose? I mean, if 20,000 uh, licenses have been cancelled, uh, you know, the purpose is, I think, very clearly within the present regime is to create a climate of fear, a sort of a general fear. And much of this is random fire. I mean, they, they, many of these organizations not only have done nothing wrong, but they don't even, are not even critical of the government. And so you've just created a kind of random fire where people are constantly now forced to look over their shoulder, are worried about speaking out. And Article 19 is, is, is you know, the right of, the right to dissent, the right to form associations, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and all of that is being very consciously curtailed uh, by this. It's not, it's not, it's not just bureaucratic sort of bloody mindedness. I think there's a, there's a pattern to it to create a sense of fear and that is pervasive across the sector now. People are really scared to do the most elementary kind of engagement uh, with, with uh, you know, with public policy, with... Uh Can I add to this? Yes, please. The second reason, one is of course fear. The second reason, because I, I asked the NGOs that I was working with right across the country, tribal groups, Dalit groups, disability organizations, right to food groups, right to education, right to healthcare. They were not misusing money. They had not stolen any money anywhere. Why were they stopped? And the answer came to me pretty, pretty late when I saw an affidavit filed in court. The real reason why they stopped these NGOs were because at some time or the other, they were criticizing the government's practices. And in an affidavit, they said, the reason why we are stopping you in one particular case is because we don't want you to take foreign money and then criticize the policies of the government. If you take it and support the government, you can have your FCRA. But if you take it and criticize the government, we don't think that's a good thing to do at all. So I think many of the leading NGOs in this country lost their FCRA, not because of any hanky-panky, not because of any illegality, not because of any breach of FCRA, but because they would criticize government policies. And that criticism couple was not political. It was not against the BJP or this government or that government. It was criticism of how you're running your food program. It was criticism of your public hospitals. It was criticism of the millions of children out of school. Practical, factually correct criticism. They said, you must shut up. You can't speak. You take foreign money, you can't speak. And that's why they carpet bombed. They carpet bombed 20,000 NGOs. In fact, this criticism should aid the government, help the government to reformulate their policies so that actually the poor are empowered, right? And you don't have so much children with, who are, whose nutrition malnourished children, wasted children, when I mean, we're the highest number in the world. And, and some of these, NG and incidentally, some of these NGOs are governed by huge trusts abroad, right? And these trusts have mechanisms to ensure that the money that they give is utilized properly. They have a responsibility to the trust that they manage. So not only is the government <coughs> of India concerned, it is the NGO who is concerned because they have to answer to the charitable trust abroad as to how they have utilized the money. There's a three audit system couple. Exactly. The organization does an audit. The government checks that audit. The charity commissioner checks the audit and the foreign government checks the audit. Four times the audit is done. And have you ever got an audit report that says that you have mis misapplied the no, money? Never. And no, I've never seen a single organization. Some small little thing, Kabul, you'd be, you'd laugh if you see it, you know. 
that this amount of money should have been put in this account by mistake you put it in that account that kind of small thing well i'm going to quote to you a gem as part of the judgment of the supreme court where they upheld the fcr act and the restrictions and their gem is the following philosophically foreign contribution donation is akin to a gratifying intoxicant replete with medicinal properties and may work like a nectar however it serves as a medicine so long as it is consumed brackets utilized moderately and discreetly for serving the larger cause of humanity otherwise this artifice has the capability of inflicting pain suffering and turmoil as being caused by the toxic substance brackets potent tool across the nation in that free and uncontrolled flow of foreign contribution has the potential of impacting the sovereignty and integrity of the nation its public order and also working against the interests of the general public east india company was clearly an ngo this 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 is from the supreme court now it says it has the potential of impacting the sovereignty and integrity of india it doesn't say that it has impacted the sovereignty and integrity of india let's talk of numbers and i'll come to this issue now the total number and the average contribution to an ngo is about 1 crore odd lakhs correct right correct right over the year yes so the total if you have 16000 ngos you'll have 16000 crores in one year okay and your total budget is 47 lakh crores and this 16000 crores is targeted at the marginalized now how is they ever going to impact the sovereignty and integrity of india and public order and public interest i have not been able to fathom and there is nothing than the judgment that even suggests as to how it will so impact and give one example of any ngo in this country one prominent example whose work impacted the sovereignty of india government of india will be hard pressed out of the tens of thousands of ngos to give say 10 20 30 cases and put it up for public scrutiny government will be very hard pressed is the sovereignty of india you think so fragile that it can be impacted right. by that that's right is it possible uh, it uh, is fathomable yeah. and this court actually had no data before it it was a fanciful statement it had no data to show that we were undermining sovereignty and integrity of and including they also talking about economic sovereignty which means actually if you're criticizing a company uh, a uh, uh, government for displacement of large number of tribal people uh, or you are critical of uh, of the labor policies of particular government environmental policies those are seen as uh, coming in the way of uh, of growth and therefore against the sovereignty of the nation so it's a very so it's a very perverse so the irony understanding is of course that uh, if tribal people or rural people or or, or workers are fighting for their constitutional rights in court yes that should not be construed as being against the constitution of india or the government of india it is one thing to ferment riots it is another thing to uh, i don't know how it is possible but maybe to be on the borders and let strange countries come in i don't know but how ngos can do that but it is something very different when the accusation relates to uh, empowering people by informing them about their rights now i want to ask a, a broader question if if there is concentration of wealth in the hands of four or five big corporations in the country i think that's a lot of, that's a threat to the public interest massive. it's a massive threat to in fact the integrity because that money can be used it's so powerful and nowadays we are told and you know i've 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 seen some of these ted talks they say that the new empires of the world are not going to be countries but these big behemoth giants which f- flow information beyond boundaries right information that they can manipulate those are the real ones that can impact the integrity and sovereignty of india not money that helps the marginalized and the poor i mean that's something so unfortunate that we that as a nation we think like that i want to give you some figure this is the status of the marginalized communities and these are official figures when i give them 
Tribals and Dalits stand out as some of the most economically disadvantaged groups in India, with 35% and 25% respectively falling below the poverty line. Data from the Socioeconomic Caste Census 2011 reveals that 83.55% of scheduled castes and 86.53% of scheduled tribe household, the highest earning member earned less than 5,000 rupees a month. Dalit and Adivasi households earn 21% and 34% less than the national average household income, while upper caste households earn nearly 40% more than the average. This is the state of the marginalized, and you want to make sure they don't even get the little funds that flow from charitable organizations. I think this is a very, very sad state of affairs. Now, what do we do about it? The Supreme Court has now held this. The FCR is good law. And the political parties don't talk about it because the political parties supported it in all in parliament. And people don't have a voice. And those who had a voice are made to shut down. Oxfam has shut down. CPR is, is, is shutting down, right? Many of your organizations are all shut down. So the big funders are shutting down. They don't want to, you know, suffer the hassle of these kind of acts. And they don't want to be blamed and accused of, of being anti-national. So the funds will be a trickle now. And uh, ultimately, there'll be social unrest. Right? And that's not good for the country. Yeah. And one more thing, Kapil, to add to all this is the fact that NGOs today don't have the confidence that if they go to court, they will get a serious and sympathetic hearing. Ten years ago, the situation was different. They would go. They would have confidence in the court. They would have confidence in the Supreme Court. Today, they don't have confidence that the judiciary will stand by them. In a patent case of, of violation of human rights of the NGOs and their people, they don't have confidence to go to. As a lawyer, I say, why don't you go to court? And they say, well, the court is different. It's not like before. We're not confident that we'll get a sympathetic hearing. And I think they're right. No, I think that you may get a sympathetic hearing. They may, you may not get a sympathetic order. Oh. There's, a, there's a difference between yeah. the two. <laughs> and that's so sad because I, I take so many of these cases. I would love to take so many. The injustice. You've been so fighting obvious. for the for in Manipur. You've been fighting for the cookies. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yes, but it's very hard now. So the change in the judiciary has impacted the NGOs terribly. I think the truth is that there are there are safeguards in the law which ought to be strictly enforced. And I, a famous Supreme Court judge said that the history of liberty is the history of insistence on procedure. So reasons to believe, uh, materials on record. A lot of this is gives enough for people to fight on principles of natural justice and also the, the fact that strict uh, provisions of the law have to be construed in accordance with the constitution. So if for example, if the, if the allegation against you could be as simple as that you are you're publishing news programs, although entities which, are, which accept foreign funds are not allowed to publish news programs. Or academic papers or acad which are critical of the that's government. That's what I'm saying. Academic papers are not covered by news programs. I think that's a fairly that's a, that, that should be a fairly easy uh, interpretive call for the, for the courts to take if and when these cases do reach before them. I think the truth is that, uh, and also I, I think the larger point is simply this, uh, people band together for all kinds of things. There are corporations which do, which do a lot of good as well. There are NGOs which do a lot of good. I think that the general principle of funding towards them should be similar in the sense that it should be proportional. The dangers which each has can also be proportionally dealt with. I mean, a lot of the... So there are systems in place that can deal with the place. danger. That's not an place. issue. Because you have the act which says if you want to convert somebody, you'll be prosecuted. So you have systems in place. Right? So therefore, why should be... A fr why, any NGO which does any of this must be dealt with. But why should the NGO who wants to serve the communities, why should they be stopped by these kind of regulations? That's a very serious Don't issue. stand in the way of a good thing. That's correct. Help people who you can, not, not impede the path. Well, I'll give you a personal example. It's very interesting. I'm a member of parliament. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody invites me for a talk abroad, as you know that as a member of parliament, I cannot take any foreign contribution. 
naturally and rightly so. I mean, I cannot be funded by a, by a foreign contributor. I cannot take money for my election or otherwise. And that's a good thing. Now, when I go abroad, somebody will, uh, you know, have to pay for my travel, right? He'll also have to pay for my, you know, staying abroad for a couple of days if I have to give a lecture, right? And they'll be actually be hosting me there. Now, that's foreign contribution under this act. So I have to take a clearance from the Ministry of Home Affairs. So I'll have to give them, the Ministry of External Affairs will not give me a clearance, will not give me a no objection. And this takes about a week's time. So what happens is the Ministry of Home Affairs will ask you, what is your program? Then I have to give a brochure. This is my program. What's the topic of why you're going abroad? Now, in a democratic country, I mean, you must have some confidence in your member of parliament that he's not going to go, go abroad to destabilize this country. He's not going to go abroad for anti-national activities. Even this amount of confidence they don't even have in their own members of parliament. This is the mindset of the government that I'm talking about. If this is que us, you can imagine their mindset, que your NGOs. And the problem is of mindset. And that mindset becomes even more static if the court does not interfere. But again, I want to underline something. They, you know, to simplify, there are two kinds of NGOs. One, which is dedicated to providing services, which you've been talking a lot about. You're providing health services, educational services, your um, uh, work for the Adivasis, etc. But there's another kind of um, organization which sees itself as, as being vigilant uh, about public action, which will talk about this is wrong in public policy, uh, this is what needs to be done for workers, this is what needs to be done for environment, etc. Uh, uh, for gender rights, for Dalit uh, equity, etc. I think the government is is even more repressive with regard to the second. And that is part of not wanting. So now they're controlling in universities what you can research. I mean, it's, it's really absurd uh, when you think of Rabindranath Tagore had said, you know, where the mind is without fear, where the head is held, held high, where knowledge is free where the world has not been broken up into narrow domestic walls. I and mean, we, we've gone so far away from it, especially so in the last 10 years. So I, I think we have to understand that the repre that this, it's not a random attempt to sort of cancel 20,000 uh, licenses. It's an attempt to control the public discourse. Anything that can be, that is not celebrating uh, the actions of the government, but also increasingly the ideology of the government. Well, what can I say? I can only thank you for an absolutely robust discussion. Uh, you know, this is a conversation where information um, is given for, for people to know what's happening on the ground, right? This is not to criticize anybody, not to point fingers at anybody, but ultimately it's to improve the environment in our country that all of us, you know, the poor, the marginalized, the corporate sector, everybody works for the future and for the good of the country. So thank you very much for being with me today.